that's done it's it really comes down to this it's not finding yourself it's finding God and once you've done that you can do your purpose you find your purpose and then and only then you can do whatever you set your mind to because your mind will be on God there's prayer partners in the back if you need
Jesus, thank you for allowing us to be here in this room tonight. And I just want to thank you for allowing all these students to have open hearts tonight to just listen to Pastor Jesus' message. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Y'all can head back to your seats. Hello, hello, hello. What is up, everybody? It's so good to see you guys today. Y'all doing all right? Let's try one more time. Y'all doing all right? Okay, if you're not, you can tell me. You don't have to say yes just because I asked. Um, I miss you guys. I don't know if y'all noticed, but I haven't been here in two weeks. Uh, sorry, I don't hate you. This is what happened. Two weeks ago, everybody say two weeks. Two weeks ago. I was with my family on vacation, and then last week, I got very sick. I had a 104-degree fever, and I was blind. I was <laughs> just making stuff up. That didn't happen. But I, uh, I did really, I was sick, and so I couldn't preach, and yada, yada, yada. So a couple things to that. One, I missed you guys. Two, uh, if you were here last week, who was here last week? Show of hands. Okay. Uh, my friend Pastor Jr. preached, and Pastor Jr. Come here, Pastor Jr. Come here, Pastor Jr. I didn't really get to introduce you, but he just joined our team. You're gonna see a lot more of him. But he was like literally less than 24 hours before I needed him to preach. I was like, "Can you preach?" He's like, "Yeah, I got you." So can y'all say thank you to him for uh, doing his thing? Um, well, we are in a series called Slip and Slide. Dealing with temptation. Everybody say temptation. And I'm excited to dive back into this topic. Here's why. We all struggle with temptation. Every single person. Your parents struggle with temptation. Your grandparents struggle with temptation. Your pastor struggles with temptation. There's something about knowing that you should not do something that makes you want to do it. Like the big red button that says, don't push. What do you want to do? Bah, 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 bah. You're like, I wonder who died just now after I pushed that button. Or you ever go to a museum on a field trip or something, and it's like, do not touch the thing. What do you do? You touch the thing. I'm a child, man. I still do that. it would be like roped off, and I'll be like, <laughs> and I'm not lying. There's this uh, like big old chapel called the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And my wife and I were there. And, like, I didn't want to take a picture of the Sistine Chapel. I didn't care at all. But then they were like, don't take a picture of the Sistine Chapel. So guess what I did? Just to get away with it. Just to say I did. Look. Oh. Why does it look like that? I'm trying to hide. Ah, I can't. There we go. No. Can you see me at all? Count, count down from three. Three, two. All right. I'm having too much fun. Anyway, um, there's just something about knowing that you shouldn't do something that makes you want to do it all the more. I'll never forget when I was in high school, I was shooting some hoops after school, and Larry Long's not up here, right? Okay, he's a principal. And me and my friend were shooting, getting buckets, and I missed, and the ball almost hit the fire extinguisher handle, and I was like, oh, that was close. And then it was like, I wonder if we can hit the fire extinguisher handle. So we sat there for like 30 minutes just trying to hit the fire extinguisher handle. And finally we hit it and nothing happened. And I was so disappointed. I was like, oh, I've been working so hard for this. So my friend went over there and he's like, this is stupid. Poof, and he just punched it because we thought it was a deactivated fire hydrant, no, uh, uh, fire extinguisher. And when he punched it, all hell broke loose. It was like, Poof, and it just kept 
going. And we're like, this is horrible. I don't know if you've ever set off a fire extinguisher. Don't. Unless, I'm just kidding, don't. But it's like this like weird little powdery residue, and it was everywhere. Guys, we had to spend hours cleaning up the gym, and then after that, I got community service, and I had to spend weeks stabbing trash on the highway. Why am I telling you this? I don't know. Here's why. Because this is how it works, okay? Something seems like a really good idea at the time. You're like, this is going to be fun. And it's tempting. And then you do it, and it might be fun, but there's always consequences. Everybody say consequences. And it's the consequences that we don't like, which just a little side note, okay? Some of you guys think that God is just a guy that says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And I just want to say, maybe God's saying not to do stuff, not because he doesn't want you to live some life that you don't like. Maybe God asks you not to do things because he doesn't want you to reap consequences you don't like. God actually loves you. God is for you. God wants you to have life and life to the best. But it's the consequences. So here's a sentence I want you to just stick in your brain. Normally you read the underlined part. I still want you to read the underlined part. But let me just read it first, okay? It says this. Sin takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you more than you want to pay. Think about that. All right? Now you got the underlined part. Sin takes you further than you want to go. Keeps you longer then you want to stay, and it costs you more than you want to pay. So let's talk about temptation. Everybody, one more time, say temptation. I'm going to show you one of my favorite scriptures on this subject. Um, it's James 1, 9 through, 12, or 9 through 15, but we're going to read the first three verses, 9, 10, 11, 12, first four verses. I can count. First four verses, and you got the underlined part, Okay. Disclaimer, at first I didn't understand what this had to do with temptation, but I'm going to explain it to you. He says this, believers who are, verse 9, believers who are, yeah, we got it? Okay, cool, 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 let's do it. Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all of their achievements. And I didn't understand what this had to do with temptation. It just sounds like he's talking about rich people and poor people. But he says this, look, verse 12. He says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive a crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This always used to confuse me because it's like James says, the rich, you should be happy. Not because you're rich. You should be happy because you're going to get humbled by God. It's like, what? Why would I be happy about that? Then he says, the poor, you should be happy. And normally, they're like, you're poor. You're not happy. You're like, poor. But he says, you should be happy. Because God's going to honor you. And I was trying to figure it out. Here's the point. I'm going to make the point and then I'm going to explain it. This is what James is saying. How does this have to do with temptation? Number one, anything can be a temptation. Everybody say anything. Now think about it. Here's what he's saying. If you're rich, you wouldn't think of being rich as a temptation. But he's saying if you're rich, it can be a temptation. Because now you could be tempted to think like, oh, I'm better than them. Oh, I got it all figured out. Oh, I did all this myself. But he says, also, if you're poor, it can be a temptation. Because if you're poor, you can start to think like, oh, God forgot about me. God must hate me because my family don't have as much as other people. James is saying this. Every single life circumstance, everything, it can either make you more like Jesus or less like Jesus. Everybody say more or less. Now, this is the reason I'm pointing it out. We typically think of temptation just like with real bad things, like stealing. Oh, I'm tempted to steal. <laughs> Yesterday I said murder, and I was like, who's tempted to murder? Who's tempted to murder? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> or like, you know, you mess around with your boyfriend and your girlfriend. Temptation. That's what we think of temptation. And I'm telling you, like, no, temptation's bigger than that. 
Anything in your life could be a temptation. And I got to tell you that because how will you know to fight temptation if you don't even see that anything can be a temptation? See, let, let, me, let me say it like this. There are good things. Ever say good things? Everybody say good things. There are good things that can be a temptation. Let's say like you find someone that you really love in the sixth grade. What was the dude's name? I always used to make a joke. It was Ignacio. Thank you. You're the OG. Ignacio. Okay, give it up for Nick Wyman. He's been here for forever. Ignacio. I need to bring him back. Ignacio is one of my greatest hits. Okay, let's say you find love. That's a good thing. But that can make you more like Jesus, right? It could teach you to be more um, humble, more generous, more loving. But it could also make you less like Jesus, you find love and all of a sudden that good thing can be a temptation that now makes you like put somebody else ahead of God. Or how many of you know those people that they found a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then they lost all their friends because they didn't make time for them anymore. And it become a temptation. Some of you are like, yeah, I've been there. Haven't talked to Samantha since April. You know what I'm talking about? It could be more or less. Okay, let's do another good thing. Let's say that you got like a starting spot on the team, like you worked your butt off for it and you're starting on the team. That's a good thing. Proud of you. But you got to understand that that could be a temptation. It can make you more like Jesus or less like Jesus. It can make you more like Jesus if you're like, man, I got this spot and I'm going to be humble about it. I'm going to use my platform to like help others be a good leader, show what it's like to be a godly athlete. Or it can make you less like Jesus. It can make you look down on all the people that are riding the bench. It can make you conceited. And arrogant. Any, what can be a temptation? Anything. Good job. Okay, now let's take not good things. Let's take bad things. Okay, let's say that you lost a loved one. A lot of people did during COVID. That's hard. Actually, that can still make you more like Jesus somehow. Like, even through that, you can really be assured of the eternal life we have in Jesus and in the comfort God brings. But also, it can be a bad thing. Losing a loved one, it can, it, it can tempt you to be less like Jesus. How? It might make you think, God forgot about me. God doesn't care. God left me. God, Listen, here's my point. Anything can be a temptation. I'll stop giving examples, but if you just think of your life in terms of like, the only temptations I face are, you know, being greedy, talking back to my parents. No, no, no. Everything in your life can be Something that makes you more like Jesus or less like Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. Ask yourself, if anything can be a temptation, is this, whatever this is. Can you put it on the screen? It's a, it's a question. Ask if anything can be a temptation, is this, whatever you're going through, is it making me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Now, let's continue what James has to say. Verse 13 through 15. He says this. I like this part. He says, and when you're being tempted, do not say, that's bad, let's try again. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God's never tempted to do wrong, and God never tempts anyone else. Tem this is a hard pill to swallow. You ready? Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to This is what James is saying. When you're tempted, don't blame God. God. God put me through this. God made me and my boyfriend hang out really late at night alone together. Nuh -uh. Don't blame other people. Uh, Pastor G, you always start your sentence like that. Uh, Pastor G, that I wouldn't have done it, but they did this. They, and please, for the love, don't say the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. I was not going to kill him, but the devil made me do it. Y'all ever seen those shirts? I have a shirt. You ever seen these shirts? That's an actual picture of the devil. That's why it's not. The devil's not red. Um. James is saying this, whenever you sin, whenever you sin, it's for one reason and one reason only. Put up verse 14 one more time. Temptation comes from our 
own desires. James is saying, we only give into temptation and sin for one reason. Because at the end of the day, we wanted to. It's, it came from us. So, number one, anything can be a temptation. But number two, everyone sins because they want to. Say everyone. Now, you'll hear people say like, I had to lie or I'd get kicked off the team. No, 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 no. Like, I get where you're coming from, but you didn't have to lie. You just wanted something. You wanted to be on the team more than you wanted to tell the truth, right? You did it because you wanted to. Or like, I had to rob the bank. They had a gun to my head. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. I have six times. I'm just kidding. But, but at the end of the day, I probably, you know, I shouldn't say this, but I might rob the bank too if there's a gun to my head. I don't know if I'd be strong enough to be like, no, kill me. No, I wouldn't do that. But at the end of the day, you didn't have to. You just wanted to live more than you wanted the bank to keep their money. You know what I'm saying? We all sin for one reason, because we what do. It's like this. Gabe, will you come here real quick? Everybody get up for Gabe. Will you hold this? I have a nickname for Gabe. It's Spitty Gabe. Gabe spits so much. So when you see Gabe, be like, hey, Spitty Gabe. All right, Gabriel. I'm just going to put this in here real quick. <laughs> All right. Can I ask you a question? Spitty Gabe. Give it up for Spitty Gabe. Here's my question. Why did Gabe, why did Spitty Gabe spill the water? Talk to me. Why did Spitty Gabe spill the water? Because I hit him. All right. We'll try it again. Yeah, I didn't know there was a splash section, did you? Welcome to SeaWorld. All right. Ah! That was horrible, Gabe. Come on, man. Kind of hurt my hand, too. All right. My bad. Oh, it's Maddie. I don't care. Um, why, why did Gabe? No, 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 you were not done yet. We did this yesterday. We practiced. Why did Gabe spill the water? Say Say it again. Because I made him, because I hit him. Yeah, we agree. Okay, y'all are real smart. Huh. Same thing. No water. Would you? I thought y'all said it's because I hit him. Gabe spilled the water. Listen to me. Gabe spilled the water because there was water in the cup. I did the same thing. And ain't no water come out. Here's what I'm saying. What are you talking about, Pastor G? This makes no sense. All right, listen, I'll make it make sense. We sit here and we say, God made me sin or they did that. Pastor G, I wouldn't have sinned, but they swung first. They disrespected me. The devil made me do it. And my point is, when it comes to temptation, the point is not to never run into anybody who will push you, shove you, rub you the wrong way, talk disrespectfully. The point of dealing with temptation is to get anything out of your heart that would dishonor God when you get in that scenario in the first place. You can sit down. Thank you. You can keep that cup. So here's what I'm saying. Listen, you, you got two options in life, okay? You can try to avoid every single temptation ever in the world, but guess what? That's not going to work. You're going to run into people at school that rub you the wrong way. Sometimes, like, when you're dating somebody and if you're attracted to them, you're going to be tempted. Like, you are going to find situations that bump you, that rub you the wrong way, that irk you, that make you want to sin. Your job is is not to say, I'm avoiding all of that. Yeah, avoid what you can, but you're not going to be able to avoid all of it. Your job is to pray what King David prayed when he said, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Because at the end of the day, I want my heart to be so clean that even if they talk back to me, I don't sin because I didn't have that in my heart. I only had love. At the end of the day, even if... Even if they let me down, even if they disappoint me, I didn't talk bad about them. I didn't gossip about them. I didn't swing back because I presented my heart to God and I said, God, get all of the ugly stuff out of me. Because when I was hit, Jesus was tempted, was he not? 
Jesus spit on Jesus, was mocked Jesus, was hit. Did Jesus ever sin? No. Why? Because Jesus had nothing in his heart that wanted to dishonor God. Everyone sins for one reason, because it's what we want most. And the goal of our lives should be, God, help me get all of this grossness out of my heart. Help me get all, anything that doesn't honor you, Jesus. I don't want it in my heart. So help me, because that's God's will for you. His will for you is not to just be able to avoid all temptation. His will for you is to be able to withstand all temptation. His will for you is to be able to go through it and still stay strong. You think you're going to get through high school without ever being tempted? No. But God has a will for you in high school. He has a will for you to go through like, like a solid Christian who said, no, yeah, I got tempted. I just wanted something more. I wanted Jesus. No, I got tempted. I just wanted something more. I, I didn't want to get close with that friend group more than I wanted to get close to God. I didn't want to get close to this boyfriend or girlfriend more than I wanted to love God. You see what I'm saying? It's a heart thing. And you got to make sure that every single day you're saying, God created me a clean heart. If it's not from you, I don't want it in there. Amen? All right. Now, so far, oh, so let me say this. Ask this. Even though this is tempting, this is on the screen too, right? Yeah, thank you, guys. Even though this is tempting, what do I want most? When you're in the heat of the moment, like, oh, even though it's tempting, what do I want most? So, so far we see this. James says anything could be a temptation. Everybody say anything. Then he says, everyone sins because they just want to. Ever say everyone? So the question really becomes, how do I cause my heart to want the right things? How do, I, how do I find the strength? And here's what James would tell you. Number three, only one can give us the strength. Hey, temptation is hard to deal with. But only one person can give you the strength to not make the dumb decisions that you'll have to reap consequences for. Like I just said, Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned. In Matthew 4, it's a pretty intense story where Jesus is in the wilderness and the devil comes up to him and he tries to, to tempt him. Has anybody heard that story? You've heard of it? Jesus in the wilderness, like five people. Can you raise your hand higher? All right, yeah, I know more of you heard than that. Okay. So this is what it says in Matthew 4, 1. I'm, I'm, I'm going to teach you something here. And normally youth pastors don't go this in depth, but I believe that you're smarter than the world believes that youth are. I think you're really smart. So I think you're going to be able to understand what I'm about to tell you, but make sure you listen. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Leave that up. So the Bible, the New Testament, it wasn't written in English. It was written in a language called Greek. How about I say Greek? So this word, uh, see where it says eremos, bottom left? That's, that's the word for wilderness in Greek. I'll tell you why that's important in a second. But I always read this like, man, the devil's jacked up. Like when Jesus was in the wilderness, all sweaty and gross and just no cell phone service. The devil came and he started like tempting Jesus. And then I realized something. I realized that that word wilderness, it actually, it means a lot. Like it, 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 it means like a quiet place. It means like a place of prayer. It means, so watch this, Eremos. Remember that word? Jesus uses it in other places, like in Mark 6, 30 through 31. It says the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour. They told him everything they had done. They were all pumped. And then watch, Jesus says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place. What's that word? Eremos. And rest a while. So it wasn't just like a wilderness. The Eremos was like a quiet, it was the place of prayer. It was where Jesus would go when he needed rest and when he needed strength and when he needed to connect with God. So now with that in mind, look at Matthew 4, 1. One more time. It says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But now I want you to think of the wilderness as the place of prayer, the quiet place, the place where he got his strength. Because I always read it like, man, that's so jacked up. The devil came to Jesus when he was in the wilderness and vulnerable. And there's truth to that. But I think I had it backwards. I think that the devil came to Jesus after Jesus got done praying in the quiet place. And I don't think Jesus was like at the bottom of his power. I think Jesus was like at the height of his power with connection to God. Like you ever been to Ignite and you'll leave a night service and you like feel the presence of God so strong. And like some of the stuff you struggled with, you don't even want to do it anymore because you and God just had that good of a time. You know what I'm saying? That's what Jesus just got out of. And Jesus needed to be in that quiet place, in that place of prayer, to be able to withstand temptation. And what I'm telling you is if you got a 
if you even want a shot at being able to withstand the temptation that comes in your life, you got to make it a habit to get away to your quiet place with God and pray and connect with him and get strength. If Jesus had to do it, listen, we're going to have to do it too. So my, my challenge is this, okay? I've been saying ask all this stuff. So if only one can give us the strength and that person is Jesus, then here's what I want you to ask. In my everyday life, is prayer a priority? You've got to learn to pray. We need it. Try to finish this. Jesus said, Jesus said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily. And then later he says, I am the bread of life. You know what he's saying? He's saying that every day you got to be talking to Jesus. Every day you got to be making time. I'm so glad you're at church. You need church. But church is once a week. You don't eat once a week. You eat every day. You need to talk to God every day. You want to be strong. You got to feed your spirit with prayer and time in his word every day. If you don't know how to do that, listen, it's okay. Just talk honest to God. Put some worship music. If we sing a song here that you like, we'll tell you the title of it. You can look it up on whatever free app you're pirating music on. And you can, what's it called? Music? What's the, Musy? Yeah, Corey uses music. Grow up, bro. You have a job. Get Spotify. Um, but here's, here's what I'm saying, okay? You got to make time with God a priority. Got to, got to, got to, got to. Prayer has to be prominent in your life if you're going to be able to withstand things. And I'm glad you're at church, but I'm here not so this can be your one touch of God. I'm here so that you could learn and so that you could go live a faithful life to God when you leave here. So no recap that anything could be a temptation. Never say anything. Everyone sins because they want to. Never say everyone. But only one can give us strength. Never say only one. Would you bow your head? Would you bow your, uh, close your eyes. I'm going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you were tempted to the fullest extent to go through it, God, and to show us how we should fight temptation. God, let us fight not by might nor by will, but by the power of your spirit. God, let us really develop a real prayer life. Let us take the sermons that we hear at SM and really think about them. Let us go read them later and, and, and God, ask, you know, what you want us to do about it. I just ask that you help this school year be the best one yet for all these students. They go through it with strength and with grace, honoring you every step of the way. Hey, before we leave, I got two questions. And here they are. They're just designed to make sure that when it comes to your relationship with God, that you and God are good. So a lot of people, they just try to do enough good works and then they hope they get into heaven. That's not Christianity. That's not the Bible. This is, this is what Christianity is. It's knowing we could never do enough good things, but that God died in our place. And if we believe in him and we accept that goodness and accept that love, he'll start to change us so that we look more like him every day. So here's my question. If you're in here and you don't know if you've ever really given your life to God, you just try to do the best you can. But today you say, I want Jesus. I want to believe that he really died for me. I know I'm a sinner, but I know he's the Savior, and I want to accept him into my heart. If that's you, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to make you stand up, come up here, nothing like that. I just want to know who I'm praying for. So if you're like, I know I'm a sinner, I know Jesus is the Savior. I want to give my life to him. On the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Who am I talking to? Awesome, 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 awesome. Let me ask you another question. If you're in here and you're like, Pastor G, at one point I was following God, but I haven't been following like I know I need to, and I need to rededicate my life to him. If that's you, you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. On the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Anybody like that? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I see you. Okay, would you put your hand on your heart, repeat after me, say, Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a Savior. Thank you for loving me when I didn't care about you. Thank you for running me down when I was running away. Make me new, and if I fall, give me the grace to get back up. Put people in my path who will lead me to you. I believe 
that you are Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, 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 amen. Well, hey, we're about to give you a chance to bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord for his work. But before we leave, uh, there are two people really close to my heart that I want to honor. And actually, the first one is playing the piano right now. Nick, get off the piano. Will you come here? So y'all don't know this, but if there is one person more permanent to this youth group than me and Delphine Figueroa, then it's Nick Wyman. Um, Nick, you, you see him up here every single week leading. Um, I always tell Nick, like, he's like my unofficial staff member. One day I'm going to work with him. I always tell him that. One day we're going to work together. But uh, he's graduating, and this is his last SM. And I just, guys, listen, SM does not happen without the help of so many people. I mean, even all the leaders around standing on the wall, y'all don't understand how, how special of a place they have in my heart. You think like these lights just turn on or the small groups lead themselves or the balls get put out and the, the stuff gets set up or the concession stuff gets so, or y'all get checked. Y'all know that takes a lot of work, but it's really rare when there's a student who's responsible for how much gets done. And I'll just tell you this, I would not have been able to lead this youth ministry the same way if Nick Wyman wasn't here. And so with all, like, I don't want him to leave. I'm going to cry a lot when he leaves. But I just want y'all to know, um, what I just want y'all to appreciate what a good example he set. And I just, he leads the, how many of y'all like the worship music and you like singing? Okay, y'all know he's led that. He's put that on his back for so many years. Since he, when we started, I was taller than you. And, and he was still, you know, leading the band, doing all this stuff, always talking to the talk back, saying, go to the course, repeat it here, doing all this stuff you never hear. But, uh, Nick, from the bottom of my heart, I just love you, man. And I couldn't be more proud of you. I couldn't believe in you more. Um, so, everybody, we're going to pray for Nick. There's a lot of seniors we'll pray for later, but, Nick, you got a special place in my heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Nick. God, I thank you for everything uh, that you're doing in his life. God, I thank you that you knew exactly what you were doing when you knit him together in his mom's womb. God, you have so many gifts and talents on his life. God, I pray that as he goes to ORU, these things will unfold and he'll understand more of who he is and who he is in light of you. God, I thank you that he'll carry the, the, the weight you're asking him to carry. He'll have favor. He'll meet the right people. He'll develop in all the right ways, God, and he'll know uh, more and more every day what you're calling him to. God, let him go with confidence and let him know that he's always family here. This is always home, that we love him and that we believe in him. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. All right, the next one's not easy either. There's one more person I want to honor. Uh, anybody in here know who Emma Higgins is? Emma? Okay. So, so some of y'all may not know this. Um, Emma has been my assistant for three and a half years. She's amazing. Um, but she's been asked, she does not really want to leave SM, but she's been asked to take a different job. Uh, with the kids across the, across, like still at Faith Family Church, but across the street. And um, I want to read you a scripture because this is, when I think of Emma, this is what I think of. It's Matthew 25, 23. It says, the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And the reason I say that for Emma is, When I was first doing this youth group, it was four years ago-ish, and I had so much to do. I needed help, and Emma used to just work at Chick-fil-A. I hardly knew her. She just always would take my order. Number one, no pickles. Coke Zero. It's not a big deal. Write it down. Anyway, um, she was like, hey, is there, uh, you know, can I work part-time? So she worked part-time, and she was like the best employee ever, like ever. I write her soaring recommendations. And then... Eventually, she'd work full-time, and if you don't know how much Emma does at SM, you don't really go to SM. I'm just kidding. But Emma does so much, and there's uh, not anybody I would trust more 
with all this stuff than Emma. So when they asked me, like, Pastor G, who do you think needs to step into a, a bigger role over with the kids side of things? I was like, well, I don't want to say this, but Emma, because anytime I've given Emma a little bit, she's always been so faithful and she's done an incredible job. So this is Emma's last week, but I need to make sure that we honor her like crazy because Emma, guys, she does so much for y'all that you'll never see. And she never really cares about credit, but I'm telling you, she is incredible. So a couple things. At the concession stand, there's these little thank you notes. If Emma means something to you, go write something to her. She'll read them later. She'll cry, get, you know, snot everywhere. It's going to be great. But, but uh, I wanted to make sure that we, you know, honor her. And also wanted her to have a chance to say anything to y'all if, if she wants to. So we all welcome Emma. Um. I just wanted to say that I love you guys so much, and while I'm super excited for the next few years and my new position and everything, I am very, very sad to not be at SM anymore, and I just wanted to let you guys know that like Pastor G was saying, SM is such a special place. I grew up in Hallettsville, and my youth group was like 20 people, like 30 was a huge day for us, and so if you guys don't know, at SM, we have like 100 or 200 kids every single week, and so just know that what is happening here, even our smaller groups, everything that we do here is just um, really special and really unique, so I just encourage you guys, if you're in junior high or high school, to just keep coming to SM, get on a team and serve. Um, it really is amazing, and SM wouldn't happen without all of our amazing leaders and without Pastor G and Eden, so let's give them a huge hand. We love you. All right, so anyway, y'all make sure to give Emma a hug, tell her you love her, write her a note, but you're stuck with me still. Okay, um, I'm going to pray, and then the ushers will come with their offering. Dear Heavenly Father, bless this offering. Amen. All right, guys, we are going to go ahead and go to our small groups. <laughs> okay, so ninth grade girls, y'all can go to the left locker room with Miss Brooke. You can go to the gym. Tenth grade girls, y'all are going to be at the right locker room. Grade boys, y'all are gonna be in the gym. Eleventh grade girls, y'all are gonna be in the game room. Eleventh grade boys, y'all are in the gym. Oh, 12th grade girls, y'all are also in the game room. And 12th 
12th grade boys, y'all are in the gym. Sixth grade boys, y'all are gonna be in the lobby. Seventh grade boys, y'all are gonna be outside and so are eighth grade boys. So if you're a boy, you should not be up here still. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, sixth grade girls, y'all are gonna be in the back, in the closet. <laughs> in the closet. <laughs> Seventh grade girls, y'all are gonna be right up here. And then eighth grade girls, y'all are gonna be right back there with Miss Anna. <laughs> <laughs> 